Okay, so I'm going to move now to the main event and I'm going to welcome Ian Evans and Gwen, his helper. And I don't know whether you'll be able to see Gwen's collie dog, Jess. Um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping she'll be visible to some of you, um, but all three of you are very welcome all the way from the far north. Now, personally, I remember Ian Evans <clears throat> from Saturday Vaughan College symposiums. I don't know whether he can recall those, but they were fantastic. Um, the recording-wise, uh, Botanic Records, Leicestershire and Rutland owe Ian a great deal for all the records that uh, he and his team produced prior to his retirement. Ian gave the first talk to the Society. It's its founding talk in 1976. He joined the staff of Leicestershire Museum, Leicester Museum as Keeper of Biology in 1959. He became Assistant Director Natural Sciences for the Museum Services. And in the 1980s, he acquired the title County Ecologist. Since 1991, when he retired to Sutherland, he worked along with Pat on the flora of Ascent and they published it in 2002. In uh, 2015, when very sadly, Pat, his wife died, he took over her BSBI recording work for West Sutherland. He modestly describes himself as a jobbing naturalist but we know he's very much more. Welcome, Ian Evans, The North Coast, A Botanical Odyssey. I hope you all enjoy this. Thank you, Chair. Um, since the summer of 2015, we've been exploring and recording sites of potential botanical interest along the north coast of Sutherland and up the two big straths that discharge onto this coast, Strath Neighbour and Strathallodale. These were, up to the end of 2019, a contribution to a national survey organised by the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland for the new Atlas of, of Higher Plants, which is called Atlas 2020. My partner in this exploration has been Ascent Naturalist and friend Gwen Richards, plus her now 12-year-old colleague Jess, who's in the next room, other friends have helped, notably Gordon Rothero, who's a bryologist and a montane botanist, and Rose Scott, who's ex a Scottish natural heritage and was one chair of the Highland Biological Recording Group. Since 2016, our base has been a self-catering cottage at Tongue, where we spent two or three weeks each summer. And just to finish this introduction, this is the story of a few of the places we visited and the wildlife we've come across. Um, and that's what, and it's in um, seven sections. There's an, an introduction on the whys and wherefores, and then six sections working uh, west to east, which will become apparent. Now, um, West Sutherland runs from where I am. Uh, can you see my arrow? Can you see the arrow? Um, yes, whizzing can. around. Yeah, you yeah. can. Right. Well, uh, uh, I've got it where uh, I live uh, in Ascent, which is one of five big parishes, and West Sutherland stretches from whoops from there up to Cape Wrath and all the way along the north coast as far as a place called Melville, which is that corner is Caithness. While I've got this map up, I'll just point out a bit of the geography. There's Cape Wrath. There are three big inlets, uh, the Kyle of Durness, Loch Erebol, uh, the Kyle of Tongue, which has got a causeway across it. Loch Erebol, you have to go right round. The Kyle of Durness, you can only go across in a passenger ferry. And then um, Strathnaver coming down at Betty Hill. And finally, on the east side of this patch is Strathallodale, which comes down from the flow country and joins the sea at Melvick. So I'm going to be talking about the stretch from Cape Roth to Melvick and uh, one or two places inland as well. I'm going to use um, pyramidal bugle 
a Juga for Amidalis as an example of how we map. Uh, this is, in fact, an original painting which is sitting on the wall behind me, which was done for the flora of Assent. It's a lovely thing. Um, it grows in dry heathland or the bottom of crags. On the right hand side here, if, if, if my arrow will, you can see that, that um, pyramidal bugle is almost exclusively a Scottish plant district there, if anybody can see that. And this is the first atlas uh, that the BSBI started work on in 1955 and it was published in 1962. And of course the units are 10 kilometer squares. I contributed to this as a undergraduate on a bicycle tour of Scotland, but uh, that just shows you that that was the known distribution of pyramidal bugle at that time. Um, the second atlas in 2002, we're still on 10 kilometer squares. You can see there's a, a huge cluster in this part of West Sutherland, that's Ascent, and you'll see in a moment where those came from, but there it's still almost exclusively a, a Highland and Ireland Scottish plant. This is uh, a page from the Florissant, which we also produced in 2002, and it shows you some of the 142 sites at which we uh, located pyramidal bugle between 1988 and, and 2001. We were mapping at that stage on two kilometer squares. Uh, there are 164 of those in that parish and it took us 10 years of field work, almost full time. Um, we, we keep a record of our um, where we've been in what I call these snail trails. These are two kilometer squares um, just up the coast a bit at Loch Stack uh, on, on the Westminster Estates. And you can see the uh, tetrads, the two kilometer squares and um, you know where we went. Uh, we now uh, map by one kilometer square. And you can see that that previous map was fairly well populated with snail trails. Here is a, a map from, well, up to about late 2017 from Strathalladale, right over in the uh, eastern side of West Southern, and there we've got one kilometre squares we've surveyed up the Strath, and there's one over to the left. In between is part of the flow country, which is almost unbotanized. It has been surveyed for its peatland interest, but, and there are records buried in archives, but uh, there are enormous areas, as you can see, sometimes it's 10 kilometers between one road and the next. And in fact, the next road to the uh, east of Strathalladale is 16 kilometers away. And most of that is total uh, natural history, terra incognita, nobody knows what's there. So that's the pattern, that's the, the size of unit we use nowadays, we find that a one kilometre square with a varietal a day. Um, There's a slightly dull bit now, just uh, for those who want to know how we go about survey. Um, this is the shopping list, a, um, a specially adapted, abbreviated scientific name with top left ferns, bottom left grasses, next column over and then the, the, the other four columns are the other higher plants and you can see, whoops, that's not nice, you can see that, um, that we've crossed off the species we've seen. That's a specially adapted list uh, for West Sutherland. Um, here is a fair copy of the other side of the list. Uh, uh, I say fair copy because it's a rough one in the field and this has the details of the root and any interesting species which are given an eight-figure grid reference. Um, on the left are the notes made in the field uh, of other interesting uh, occurrences, mostly animals. I can see rabbit, I can see a horses who fungus, a fly, a butterfly, etc. These are then turned into a fair copy on the right. Uh, Old-fashioned this, it's all written as you can see. 
Uh, that's a winter job for me. I, I don't do things straight onto a tablet. Um, just to finish this section, uh, uh, on the left is a, is a map, um, uh, if you like, a, a, mo a more modern equivalent of the snail trails showing uh, exactly where we went on a particular day. Uh, at that Zachary Bowl. And uh, that was when three of us, myself, Gwen and Gordon, were out. And on the right, we, I do collect herbarium material because it's necessary at times to um, identify things. This is an example. It says ranunculus flammula, which is lesser spearwort. But right down the bottom, you can see subspecies scoticus. This is a, uh, a definite subspecies of lesser spearwort, which has virtually no blades to the leaves and single flowers and grows on the edges of locks. And you will see that again later. Right, now let's get into the, the full pictures and we'll start over in the west at Cape Roth. There's the lighthouse at Cape Roth, not always seen on such, in such beautiful weather. Uh, in order to get there, you have to go across a passenger ferry and then pick up a, a 15 seater bus, uh, which uh, goes along a very bumpy potholed road about 11 miles. And uh, what we used to do is get dropped off part of the way along on the, from the first bus and then pick up the last bus at about four o'clock in the afternoon, hopefully, although sometimes we got left behind. The, about two kilometres to the east of Cape Roth is a most delightful beach called Kiavig. And in the background, in the middle there, you can see a, a very famous stack, Stack Klo Kiavik, which always reminds me of a, um, a, a sunken liner. And on the right, you can see some of the cliffs which rise to a height of 300 metres. There's some of the the highest cliffs, it's called Clomore, the white blanket, I think, or white sheet, and they're covered, in, they have seabirds on them, but it's one of the high, it's the highest cliff on mainland. Uh, excuse me, I'm getting right. Um, there's a, a view taken uh, three years ago of myself with the beach in the background and Jess. Uh, whose only part from food is chasing things that uh, people throw for her. And I've got some heather there to get her into the picture. But again, it's a delightful spot, and you can actually walk to about a mile off the road to Cape Roth. There's, looking round to the south, it, there is an old shepherd's cottage, uh, now a mountain bothy. And um, on a fairly recent occasion, we were botanizing the, um, this area down the bottom here, uh, that the edge of the square was running there. Uh, I have been to the, the main part of the beach on several occasions, and one of the plants that occurs there, and one occasion we found it in thousands, is autumn gentian, gentianella amarella septentrionalis. I think amarella occurs in Leicestershire, I can't remember now. I've been away from Leicestershire almost as long as I was in Leicestershire, so. Uh, but that, that is one of our two gentians. We get that and we get the field gentian. But this is the paler one. But uh, on that, just behind that beach, it, it occurred one year in thousands late in the summer. Inland uh, on the, the what's called Cape Side, the Cape Roth Peninsula, there are some quite large rivers. Uh, they, in, they start from biggish hills. Uh, they are very broad. Uh, this is the Dahl River, uh, the upper part of the Dahl River, and one of the species we saw there was um, floating burr reed. I don't think this is a species that doesn't occur unless you do get other burr reeds, upright burr reeds, but this one has these green bootlace-like um, leaves. There's also um, floating pond weed there, and you can see the, the flowering spikes. That's not an uncommon plant in both rivers and uh, lochs in, uh, in uh, um, West Sutherland. Lower down the valley of the same river, the Dull River, it enters uh, a number of little gorges. That picture was taken because of the great rarity in the middle, and I'm not referring to my co-worker, I'm referring to the Rowan tree, 
that, which is one of very few trees in that valley. The, the red deer grazing pressure is quite high and trees have difficulty in re-establishing themselves and anyway it's an exceedingly windy spot. So to come across a big old rowan like that, actually if you look closely, there's a, an old left of it now covered in grass, but uh, uh, tree, trees can be quite a rarity in parts of this landscape. Oh, there's the hoodie's nest. That's a hoodie crow, uh, but it's an old one. Right, I'm hopping over now into um, Loch Eribol. This is a, a delightful limestone island called Aelan Corrie, uh, stretching across the middle of the photograph there with some of the small crofting villages, mainly the one of Laid in the background. The, the far shore, which is the west shore, is exceedingly dour from a botanical is in a uh, walking up the hill because it's on Cambrian quartzites but on top of the quartzites is limestone which uh, uh, underlies the whole of this island. There's a view from the north end of the island showing the old li lime kilns uh, where they used to burn the limestone in the 19th century. Uh, the island hasn't been occupied since the 1950s, it's uninhabited. It now belongs to Wild Land Limited um, Anders Poulsen's uh, empire running across the north of Scotland, Loch Eribol. Uh, he is a conservationist and he's doing his, his wild land is doing great things with the land. Um, but there's the actual limestone with a, a species we certainly didn't get in Leicestershire. That, uh, one of five aspleniums which occur on the island. This is sea spleen worth, Asplenium marinum with these very leathery, bright, yellowy green fronds. Um, the other big spleenwort, as it's now called, um, a Splenium scolopendrium, is heart's tongue fern, but there were three others. There was black spleenwort, and it's unusual to see all five species in a, in a relatively small area. Um, it, it wasn't an entirely um, clement day uh, when we were on the island, uh, or not in the morning anyway, and um, you can see a rather wet, wet Gwen there inspecting the uh, a limestone outcrop. There's been virtually no grazing on the island for many decades, and so it has turned into tussock grassland, and these outcrops are one of the places that prove uh, particularly fruitful of interesting species. Um, this is one I always have to look up. It's uh, Arabis hirsuta, her the hoary whitlow grass, one of the small crucifers, but absolutely typical of limestone. Frog orchids, which we get both on the limestone and also on the coast and other places, even occurs on ledges in the mountains in, at times, and can be quite variable in colour, but often has this lovely reddy brown colour. Um, shortly after giving this outcrop a good going over, we sat down to have a, a cup of tea. Our field days are punctuated by um, refreshment stops, coffee or tea in the morning, a good half hour lunch break, and, and then a tea stop in the afternoon. If you're out for six to eight hours, you do need your stops. And we were lucky on this occasion because as we were sitting, looking out over the lock, um, there appeared two otters, possibly um, a pair, uh, Gwen says, and she was extremely lucky to get this quick snatched photograph of them uh, about, uh, not more than about 50 feet away, I should think, if that. Uh, we, there are otters all around the coast and inland in, in West Sutherland, but uh, uh, you, you see them from time to time. Uh, according to tide and things like that. So that was that was a very nice addition to the uh, tea break. Um, shortly afterwards, we began to make our way back across the island to join two other friends who'd come over to do insects, birds, and we we walked into this bumpy area, and uh, looking at it rather more closely, uh, and a lot of these photographs of Gwen's, that one certainly isn't, they're a, a very large colony of adder's tongue fern. We get two adder's tongues up here, adder's tongue and small adder's tongue on the cliffs, but it's not often you see such a large colony. When I inquired later, well, it, 
what we were trying to make out is why that particular ground was so rough, full of holes. And the answer was that um, it had been used as bombing practice by mosquito bombers in World War II because the island was the same dimensions as, as the tur pits. And so they were doing uh, practice bombing runs, uh, live bombing runs, presumably, on the island, uh, which must have been a lot bearer in those days. And uh, I think this, this ground, this very broken ground, was in fact bomb crashes. But a nice story anyway. Adderstone Fern. There's, uh, the weather improved a bit as we were making our way back up the east side. That's the mouth of Loch Erebol at the top of the picture. And on the left, Stephen Moran, who's the present chair of the Highland Biological Recording Group, and carrying his um, uh, DVAC suction device, Donald Mitchell, who's the, the Highland uh, High Life Ranger for Dernis. They joined us on this trip, and we've been brought over very kindly by a man on the, the east shore with a boat, John Burnett. Um, I'm hopping over now in to the large strath. Uh, it's just a quick look at this, at the foot of Ben Hope. That is the, the bottom crags of Ben Hope on the left. Uh, again, uh, not a, an entirely nice day. Uh, Gwen's got her camera out. She does a lot of the photography. I, I do land, well, I do scene setters and Gwen takes a lot of the close-ups but what she was after on this occasion was this rather nice hybrid between round-leaved and long-leaved sundew which has these sort of spoon-shaped leaves standing upright in uh you know from the rosette um it is completely sterile you can tell when you by looking at the seeds later on in the year but it's nevertheless not uncommon round the edges of locks and along watercourses like this. That's uh, a little later on the same day we were circumnavigating a, a lovely lock covered in white water lilies and I, I put this on to show you Ben Hope that is our northernmost Munro over 3,000 feet and it has two sets of ramparts the lower ones are wooded the, the upper ones less so. Uh, a treacherous place in winter but uh, um, you know, quite an interesting place in summer. I haven't been up there for since 1956. I'll leave that to younger botanists nowadays. But, but that's not atypical of a uh, a lochen with white water lily and bottle sedge in the foreground. Right, I'm going to hop again now over to the Carl of Tongue. Um, we, we've got another mountain in the background here. That is Ben Loyal. You'll see more pictures of that. It is a lovely hill, not high in old money about two and a half thousand feet uh, with a, a sort of crenellated uh, or scalloped ridge. Um, this um, salt marsh, which is on the east side, we're looking south there, was the interest of it was discovered by a chap called Clive Chatters from Hampshire. Uh, he works for the Hampshire Wildlife Trust and he was there in 2016. He's since published an account called Salt Marsh in the British Wildlife Series. He was there in June 2016, and in November, no, September, he let us know that he found an exceedingly rare, very small plant called dwarf spike rush, Eleocris parvula. So we hastened out, having just returned from the North Coast, went back to the North Coast to have a look for it. It, it took us an hour and a half crawling around that salt marsh with an eight figure grid reference not to find it. Um, we did eventually, after we'd gone off and come back again uh, in the last half hour. But if I show you what it looks like, it's not a very showy plant. That, that's about uh, 10 centimetres high. It, it is fairly obviously a spike rush, if you know them, an Eleocharis. And it, uh, what it's growing on the right is as a winter bud. That's how they, they overwinter. Um, we did eventually actually having gone away and come back in um, and that's significant in a moment uh, but the interesting thing about it it was only the second record for mainland Scotland you can see the red arrow is where he found it and we refound it and the only other locality is down near Dornoch uh, about 100 kilometers to the south so it is a very rare plant uh, 
the reason he knew about it is you can see some dots at the bottom uh, down there, which are in Hampshire, and there's a few records on the north end of Cardigan Bay, but and one in Ireland. So dwarf spike rush, uh, a, an underwhelming but very rare plant. In in the time we took off after an hour and a half crawling around, not finding it, we went over to these pools, which are a hundred meters further to the south. And when we got closer, we found something rather odd. It's a very stringy plant, but you can see it's got curls, it's got spirals. And it is in fact a thing called spiral tasselweed, Rapia spiralis, a very insignificant plant of the, the less common species, Rapia maritima, does occur in Ascent and various other places. But the interesting thing about that, well, there it is, there, those are the fruits it, on long stalks in clusters, and you can see that the, the stalks are actually curled up in, um, you know, uh, we, we, that, that photograph and the specimens were submitted to Chris Preston, the Cambridge botanist who does pond weeds and such like, and he confirmed that you do need to collect material occasionally for, for confirmation, particularly if, as you can see, this was the first record for mainland Scotland. And total pure chance just happened to be casting our nose over this pool before we went back and finally found the confounded spike rush. So um, all's well that ended well on that day. Uh, down, uh, it's the Kinloch River, which runs into the south end of the Carl of Town with uh, Loch L uh, Ben Loyal, I think possibly the most beautiful mountain, even including our uh, iconic ones in Ascent uh, in the north of Scotland. Uh, botanically, a bit patchy, the interest, but there is interest, but it's just a lovely thing to look at. And in the foreground there, you can see common cotton grass on a, on a boggy area. We're now going to go further up that river, the Kinloch River, to a place called Carnavati, which means the heap of stones of the wolves, or wolf for wolves. And that is, I'm just trying to think how high it is, probably 500 feet from bottom to top of huge broken boulders covered in woodland and moss. The, the boulders can be as large as buses, uh, there are enormous cavities in between them and only two people that I've ever heard of have ever got into the middle of that area, uh, res risking their life. On this occasion there were four of us, help, um, we had a Land Rover hitch down to near there, two of us, uh, Stephen and I went off to do insects and uh, Rose got there with Jess and um, Gwen went up the right hand side, the northern side, right over the top and came down the left hand side. And so one or two things from Carnavati. A fungus, because we look at everything and we note anything we can identify. That's a thing called the black bulgar on an old birch, completely covered in mosses and lichens, the birch. Lovely, lovely uh, ascomycete fungus, I think. Uh, there's a view from near the top. No, part way up on the steep slope, and this is the area into which they are because it's dangerous. But so they were bottom, they were nibbling around the edge. In the background, you can again see Ben Loyal, and you can see a big lock called Lock and Jerry, which was where we were doing our insect collecting. Um, we had a we, we the road is somewhere about halfway in between. It was a fair walk in for both of us. Um, some of the species from Carnabati, cowberry, Vaccinium vitis idea, which is a lovely thing, uh, uh, evergreen, unlike ordinary bilberry, uh, and they're in full fruit. Um, I always have to get check this to get them there. Uh, th this is, um, oh, I've lost it. It's Arctostaphylus alpinus, which is the, I'm just looking for name, uh, alpine bearberry. It's, it's the higher one. We have ordinary bearberry, and then you have uh, alpine bearberry, which is on the tops, or that does come down quite low, with these lovely, what they call bullate leaves, so the blistered leaves with dark fruits. And that's where we were while they were up the hill. Uh, we were down on Loch and Jeru, 
working our way along the, lake, the edge here. An interesting thing was that uh, we went into a small thicket where there were some old hazels and very unusually up here there were young hazels because the deer numbers in this area, which is Wildland Limited, part of their estates, the deer numbers have been drastically reduced with the fact, with the effect that uh, regeneration of trees is occurring naturally and in a quantity in places. So that was a lovely thing to see. Um, then a few, a few pictures from an expedition up Ben Loyal itself, which I was not part of. This was Gordon, uh, Gwen and Rowe. And that, it can, um, this was on the, on the way up. Um, that's Rowe looking out at Loch Eribol on the left, was it the Carl of Tongue? I always get that wrong. No, it must be the Carl of Tongue. It's the Carl of Tongue, sorry. Um, uh, yes, Carl of Tongue on the left and on the right, uh, Loch Loyal. Um, my geography goes haywire at times. I wasn't on this trip, I was on, on a flatter bit of ground at the time. This is sort of typical boggy ground with a, a, a you know, predictable range of species, including, I think, hare's tail cotton grass and that sort of thing. And that, that's row, uh, the highest point of uh, Ben Loyal, which is called the castle or something like that, isn't it, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, one or two of the species are from uh, Ben Loyal. Uh, one of our montane um, saxifrages, starry saxifrage, Saxifraga stellaris, which usually occurs as here in, in um, moss tussocks right at the edge of water or very wet places. Lovely thing with those um, nectaries, as you can see, uh, there are nectaries on the flowers and there are knockings to get the insects into the centre. This is a curiosity. In the background, you can see the leaves of bilberry. This is bilberry that's been afflicted with a fungus called Exobacidium myrtili, because that Vaccinium myrtilis is the common bilberry. And it, it, it produces, it's in effect, a fungal gall. It causes the leaves to swell up and go bright red and then the um, fungal spores are produced on the underside of the leaves. So this all goes down in, in the notebook because, you know, you know, I know when that's cloudberry, uh, Rubus, Rubus canemorus, the mountain bramble, um, which you don't very often see in fruit, but it goes a lovely orange color. Uh, another montane thing, um, which unlike some others never comes down to the coast is Dwarf Cornell, which is a small shrubby relative of dogwood, uh, and that is the flowers are actually the black things in the middle. The white things are bracts, white bracts. Lovely thing. And then finally, one that I always have is the montane cudweed called Dwarf Cudweed, Nathalium supine, and that is a mountain top thing. Uh, it's obviously a member of what used to be called the compositee. Uh, and in the bottom right of the picture, you can also see Alpine Ladies' Mantle, which uh, is a good montane species. Uh, just a small taster. I am really only going to give you a taster so that when uh, COVID is over, some of you uh, can come up and see for yourself. Right, down on the uh, edge on in the summer, when there had been very little rain, I think this was 2016, and um, actually what we were looking at was the subspecies Scoticus, so the lesser spearwort, which is there. It's a lovely little thing, it, often the flowers are single, and as you can see, the leaves have no blades. Um, so uh, there are two other subspecies, uh, one of which Pat named many, many years ago when she was a research botanist. But uh, this is the one that, we, did, we do see some years when the lot levels are low and we've got quite a lot of new records. So it's lesser spearwort subspecies Scoticus. And then occasionally you get fauna, unexpected fauna. This is the, um, the banks of Loch Loyal with what appears to be a crocodile. I don't know where it came from. It was in old money, seven, seven feet long, um, but it was rather a surprise. <laughs> That's in there for a laugh. I can't hear you laughing, but I presume that somebody is. Right, now we're, we're up 
near the village of Tung, these are some lovely flowery meadows, quite a, a rare sight in, in uh, North Southern because there's a lot of sheep grazing still, but th these belong to a, a family whose seven-year-old daughter came out with us, Connie came out with us once. We, we sort of inducted her into natural history, I think, with her mother. And uh, these are the family crofts, which are, are in fact, I think, mown for um, hay later in the year. But this, this is a lovely site uh, and quite a rare site. And you can see Ben Loyal in the background. It's just below Tung Village. Um, the, the cottage we stay at, that's one end of it. I'm sorry I haven't got a better picture. Um, it's a three bedroom cottage with a little back kitchen, etc., which has just been modernized. Um, and uh, makes a very good base. It belongs to an old friend of mine from this area. And that is uh, Jess getting her um, goalkeeping skills honed first thing in the morning. Uh, the, that, that property looks out, this is the view, uh, you can wander out from the cottage 50 feet to the north and you get this incredible view over the mouth of the Kyle of Tongue which fills up with uh, sandbanks at low tide and those are the rabbit islands and we're going to have a brief excursion to the rabbits. There's the boat going across with Gordon Rothero, Stephen Backright, myself and Gwen. Uh, dinghy because uh, it's a shallow beach. We actually lost that dinghy in, in the middle of that trip and had to go back and fetch it again. Uh, there's the dinghy coming ashore, uh, quite rough, row on the right and Gordon on the left. And one or two shots, the, the island, the rabbit islands consist of two areas joined by a beach and some rocks. Uh, We'll just have a quick look. Uh, this is a common enough species, but uh, one of the uh, beaches, sea rocket. Uh, that's our entomologist at work. Uh, although there were supposed, it's called rabbit islands, there are no rabbits and there were no sheep on these islands and haven't been for quite a while. It's said that you can drive sheep at very low tide across, but nobody has bothered. So they're virtually untouched and only rarely visited, although they're very visible from quite a number of holiday cottages, etc. But you have to hire a boat to get across. Uh, Western Ireland, and a bit that Gwen and I had a particular look at, nice variety of habitats with um, what rocks belonging to the Moyne series, which are sort of flaggy. Uh, metamorphic rocks and then some dunes and then quite a nice cliff and we would have got something like I don't know 70 or 80 species from that area including um, biting stone crop and also what here's one for Tony uh, sea ivory one of the um, uh, coastal uh, and rather unexpectedly uh, a bed of yellow iris on the top of the uh, island. We didn't actually finish our side because although we're on the island for four or five hours, you, you just get your nose down and, and it, it takes a, a lot to find everything. Uh, again, all the time in this area, the beautiful uh, Ben Loyal in the background. Okay, we're now about halfway through. Not too bad. Um, and we're, we're going to go from Skerra to Armadale. Uh, these are areas to the east of the Carl of Tongue. Uh, past Aver and over towards um, Strathy Point. This is a lovely little bay called Lamigo or Lamigo, where a couple have been living and crofting very environmentally friendly manner for 30 odd years, Gavin and Kay Lockhart, and we made contact with them and had three visits. And it's quite unusual to see so much tall herb, uh, very good for insects. So that's why we had a Highland Biological Recording Group insect meeting there. But Gwen and I, we'd taken a botanical walk there and then we went back and did a proper list, 150 species in, the, in that area, in the bit you're looking at, uh, which is quite good for, um, the north. Uh, there, there are some entomologists, Graham Crittenden, the uh, 
moth and butterfly recorder on the left. Um, Stephen concealed in a hat, in his white hat, his DVAC and a, a um, beating tray and me making the notes. I, my main job on these occasions is scribe. Uh, but just an absolute lovely area. Um, right. Okay, that was just a quick look at Scarrow, which has got some very interesting bits or islands, uh, uh, which we visited on another occasion. This is Row down in a ditch at a place called Far Bay, which is just to the east of Betty Hill. We've gone a, a bit further to the east, gone across the neighbour, and I wanted to show you uh, a piece of ground called the Far Bay Glebe. There it is. It, it's a tiny triangle of land cut out of the dunes and fenced off, mainly because of great yellow bumblebees at the back of uh, a, uh, a churchyard, well, a burial ground, actually. Um, that's the auxiliary burial ground, but this has been managed for flowers and insects and just gives one some idea of what can grow when you haven't got um, a lot of sheep grazing. And that in the background is, is the far side of Far Bay and bits of Betty Hill. Um, huge stand of field scabious and greater knapweed, both of which I presume uh, occur in, I'm sure they occur in, in Leicestershire. But uh, field scabious is only found on the north coast. We don't get it down here in Ascent. And, and so for that matter is great, um, greater knapweed doesn't occur very down, far down the west coast. It seems to like these sandy areas on the north coast. There's the field scabious. Um, lovely picture with a close up of the buds. And there's the greater knapweed. We have to be careful up here because we get a variety of, of black knapweed which has ray florets which has been sown in um, roadside seed mixes, but that is definitely greater knapweed. And there's the top view of it. Lovely thing, beautiful thing. Okay, we're, going, we're hopping across now to an area called Armadale. Let me get my bearings. It's about seven miles uh, seven kilometers further to the east from the last locality. We are skipping along the coast. I'm sorry, uh, there's, there's so many things to show you. As I said, I just want to give you the flavor. A very rocky coast. There's Jess, who whatever mileage we do, probably does double as all dogs do and, and comes out on all our trips. And that is looking east uh, along the north coast there. And we're going to go over to that peninsula in the, in the mid-distance, which is called West Neve. Um, it's bounded on one side by a, a very steep-sided bay. On this occasion, I was lazy and sat at the top, and uh, Gwen and Roa are, are, are low down doing the um, uh, species on the cliffs, things like rose root, which is a, um, the largest of the sedums found uh, around uh, stone crops found around a, 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 a typical thing of the of the coast uh, whoops uh, on the top of that peninsula is creeping willow in fruit this is probably an august visit i think uh, and that's that's not the smallest of our willows because we have a, it's a lovely shiny thing uh, that occurs on cliffs and elsewhere and uh, a, a slightly tattered example of one of the most beautiful plants found along the north coast and elsewhere and um, once found in your area at Botchester Bog I've probably got the only picture of this at, in from Leicestershire from the 1960s it's grass of Parnassus uh, I have a picture when Marsh Hellebrain also used to grow at Botchester Bog and next to it it's about an inch across and it has uh, it's a, that's a rather tatty one but uh, has lovely green leaves. Next to it are the fruiting heads of spring squill, Celeberna, which is a relative of the bluebells. And uh, this is one of the many localities in which where uh, Primula scotica, the Scottish primrose, can be found. That, as you, some of you may know, is an endemic species. It's only found in the British Isles, although it's related to Norwegian one, and uh, it 
well, I was talking this morning, somebody is doing a survey. We found one locality back in 2000 plants, but that's exceptional. But it is a lovely thing. Uh, it's got the sort of flowery uh, deposit underneath the leaves and up the stem, which you get in this group of primula. So that's Scottish primrose. And uh, this is what I, we call maritime heath with uh, goldenrod, heather, and lots of other things growing in a place that's subject to um, every north wind that blows, but in the summer can look quite delightful. And this is the east side of that peninsula. Uh, well, A, where you have lunch. I think this was after lunch and Roe is already down there. And there is salt marsh. It was the only salt marsh we saw in that patch. So you have to get down and have a look at that. Uh, it's quite a steep slope and a bit rocky at the bottom, but that, that goes with the territory. At the um, top, uh, well, the end of the road leading up to this part of Armadale are the remains of an old bag netting station. They used to net salmon that worked their way along the coast and up the estuaries and up the rivers. Uh, it's no, uh, the license for that has been withdraw uh, this was the these were the poles on which they dried the bag nets when after they've been out at sea catching salmon and we went down into a down it uh, which you can see there forgetting the um uh the the, the net, nets in and out and getting messages saying my internet is unstable we will just touch wood Right, and we, we went down there. Um, it was a beautiful sunny day. We got mating common we one of Gwen's pictures and lots of other things besides. Uh, and uh, uh, we admired the extremely jagged rocks. This is not the coast on which to get wrecked in, in fog. Um, and I, I, I have to confess that all three of us took our, off our welly boots or shoes and had a paddle on that occasion. Uh, there's no point in being too serious about one's botany. Um, right, this is looking back now onto Armadale Bay from the peninsula and looking to a place called um, the, the Valley of the Armadale Burn, which is there. And just in the very background, you may be able to see one of the two big wind farms. Uh, I think that's one called Strathy. Yeah. Strathy South, uh, which are way inland in, in, in conifer plantings. But I'm going to take you down that valley in a moment. But we'll, we'll just look at one or two things on Armadale Bay. That's um, Roe, Gwen and Gordon looking superior. I don't know why, because he'd already got his water fruits on. We'd done two or three hours. We got about 200 species. Lovely area, frog, orchid, all sorts of things. And we were having lunch, putting on our waterproofs because it's starting to rain, and then plodded to the car. By the time we got to the car, I was absolutely tipping it down. But what we did find was quite exciting. That's us being excited, um, Gordon, myself, and Gwen. And, and what they're pointing at is a tiny little blue green rosette there. And there, those are the leaves of oyster plant, Matensia which is a rare coastal plant, quite a lot of it on Orkney, a, a fair bit in Caithness, but extremely rare. One locality on the west coast, yeah, it's a new locality. Whether it's still there, whether it's been eaten by sheep, we don't know. It has these water repellent leaves. So oyster plant, lovely thing, and that was a completely new record. Uh, it wasn't always sunshiny, as I said the last occasion it got very wet. This is the, Armad the Valley of the Armadale Burn, which was where we had a really delightful day, as you can see, in um, a ground, ground which I don't think anybody much had ever botanised. Uh, that was the lunch break after we fought our way in that area. In fact, it was on a, a farming programme. There's a lady. Uh, who farms it with her husband and uh, um, which is on a recent farming program but uh, I don't think the sheep get down into this bit and um, uh, there were golden ring dragonflies and all sorts of things happening. Uh, that's Gordon 
pointing at upright juniper. We have two sorts of juniper uh, in the north of Scotland, prostrate juniper, which grows flat, and upright juniper, like a shuttlecock. And this, uh, we're somewhere near the dividing line, and this is upright juniper, which you can see him pointing at. He's playing the clown. Uh, one of the nice things about this sort of area is if you can get right up the valley, and it was a bit tricky there, you do not know what's around the next corner. I mean, this is, this is part of the fun of it anyway. Uh, just, just, and, and what's more, it's probable that nobody knows what's around the next corner as far as plants are concerned, because it may never have been looked at. One of the things we saw back from the Armadale burn was um, spring squill in flower inland. That's the only in lo inland locality we've so far come across. Uh, a bit of dry heath. Earlier, there it is in flower. The lovely thing does occur down this side in acid in, in about four square meters in one place. Okay, we've got two more sections now: Strathy and then the last one, which is uh, Strathy is a a point that sticks out into the uh, Pentland Firth with a lighthouse on the end. And on the west side is this um, topographical feature known as Gloopy Brawl. Gloopy is a 50 foot deep gulch with the sea coming in it and a natural arch, not a place to slip. Uh, so I was standing, if I took this photograph, Gwen may have taken it. Uh, Gwen took it. She goes nearer the edge than I do, um, uh, uh, and we had we were doing a one k square there. But I knew from a pre one previous trip that this was a place to find purple octopus, the Scottish plant, uh, north coast, one or two mountains further south, but essentially north coast and possibly the Orkneys. I'm not sure about that. Um, let's have a look. Tarbotness, Mallow Kintyre, curiously, but otherwise north of the coast. Um, it, it is a member of what used to be called the Leguminosae, the Pelionaceae, is it now? I don't know what they call it now. Um, and there's a close up. It's an absolutely beautiful thing. Slight change of colour as the flowers mature. Uh, they're a brown male. Uh, and um, funnily enough, I had somebody on the phone today who was about to do a survey for plant life called Plants on the Edge, because this is essentially a clifftop species, it doesn't go inland. So that's purple oxytropis. Just round the corner from Gloopy Brawl was a big bay which is called Geo Rua, meaning the sort of red cave, if you like. Uh, and it was getting on for tea time, so we sat here uh, serenaded by a peregrine falcon on the right, which was rather nice. They're along there, and rather intrigued by this island in the background, which is called Aelan Island, Bursa. Never been there, I don't think any botanist ever has. There's a close-up of it. It's got caves, and it's got this peculiar triangular deposit on top, probably glacial debris, but I, I don't think anybody has ever botanized it. It would be possible to get ashore if you were agile and had a, a, a a, um, a boatman who was also it may have nesting uh, storm petrels or something like that on it. Just a curiosity, but one of those things it's delightful to see. Um, we're now going out onto Strathy Point. There is an ancient record from this area by one of the greats of Scottish botany, a lady called Mary McCallum Webster, who said on those cliffs there were three plants of rock samphire. Unfortunately, she didn't say where on the cliffs. She just said they were there in 1955. Nobody has ever found them since. I don't know if anybody will ever find them. She left no other directions. That plant is not otherwise known from the north coast or the west coast of Scotland. I've seen it once out at Ewig on the Outer Isles, but it is extremely rare. Uh, enough of it on the cliffs of Dover. It appears in Shakespeare. Samphire gatherers, dreadful trade. Rock samphire, don't know where it is, but a nice natural arch. On the way out towards the lighthouse, we sat and had a cup of coffee, or tea in Gwen's case, and watched a dunglin, selling breeding, uh, 
feeding in a puddle. There's the lighthouse. Gwen is unusually on the lead here because there are a lot of sheep. Oh, Jess, not Gwen, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Jess is on the lead. Gwen is never on the lead. She's free ranging. <laughs> um, uh, because uh, there were a lot of sheep. Uh, you can see it's extremely well grazed. You can see some sheep in the background. And uh, um, so we had to keep up very well under control. One of the things we'd gone to see, we'd gone to list as well, was more Scottish primrose, but very, very short, as you might expect, in a mat of what looks like fescue and sea plant, well, plantain anyway, maybe sea plantain. Uh, and it can occur in, in very large quantities in this sort of tiny form. Um, I said one place we actually counted in 2003 80,000 rosettes of this species by doing a sample. We didn't count everyone. Okay, in Bay, that's Strathy Point on the left. Uh, and I, I think I took this picture because the colour just appealed to me. It's like a rainbow. We were sitting on the dunes having lunch. The Strathy River was coming in on the left, bringing peaty water, hence the brown. And then uh, you'd got the sand, big sandy beach and the sea, uh, et cetera. Occasionally, well, no, quite regularly, we take time off from botanizing to do something else, just to walk along a beach occasionally. And when you are walking along a beach like that, you, you can come across very, very peculiar. If you were a live audience, I know you're live, but uh, <laughs> I would ask you what you thought might have made those tracks. And please note that they're not symmetrical. There is a sort of dragged track to the left and a sort of um, series of impressions to the right. Um, uh, you know, I, it, I, I don't think anybody has successfully guessed what made these, but I can now show you what made them. And that is a shell collector going along on her hands and knees and the, with her welly boots behind and her knees and hands. We, we spent an hour on this occasion looking uh, in a very, some very good tide lines for tiny mollusks uh, and this is something we've done on on um, beaches all the north and west coast just just for fun on a good day do something different for a bit and this is one of the mollusks this is a thing called a tiger scallop and it's uh, the size of a, a, a fingernail and that is there are three species and this is one we call the fluty there's the fluty the ribbed and I forgot what the other one's called, sort of just hasn't got any um, wrinkles on it. They are variegated. They're, they're part of a, a group of small scallops relative of the big queen scallops, uh, the ones you eat, well, queens and the edible scallops, but they're one of the most beautiful things you can find on the beach. And we have looked for these on you know, how many beaches now, 20 or 30. Sometimes when there's been snow on the beach, and other times like then when it was much nicer. Uh, having had a, a bit of time off for shell collecting, and I did some as well, uh, we then tried to get across the mouth of the Strathy River because there was a thicket on the far side that looked interesting. It proved to have quicksands, out of which Gwen, being lighter on her feet than me, uh, retreated. We then had to do a long walk round, and we did finish up in the thicket where we found this plant, which is a very odd thing to find on the north coast of Scotland. Uh, if that was in its usual purple and yellow, I'm sure you'd recognise it. It's bittersweet or woody nightshade, but it's the albino form. Um, it was the first record of woody nightshade for the north coast of Scotland and certainly the first record of the albino form and we haven't the remotest idea how it got there except that the way there was a very fine wall garden but who would introduce woody nightshade into their wall garden i don't know it's out and wild so that was that was an utter curiosity but interesting okay this is the last section some of you may be glad to hear um yeah I've had a uh, getting on for an hour now, so I'll. Strathallerdale 
you, we, I didn't really take you up Strathnaver, it, it, it discharges itself at Betty Hill, but we'll have a look at some bits of Strathallodale, which is runs parallel to the eastern boundary of West Sutherland with Caithness. The, uh, this, the, the mouth of the river is coming in top left where there's some gorse bushes on a, but this is Melvick Beach. Well, actually it's taken from uh, a bit further north. And uh, just to give you uh, an overview of a, a lovely uh, series of sand dunes with all sorts of interesting plants, the one we did not expect to find was here. Uh, earlier in the day, we'd been actually down on the beach uh, and then going up into the dunes. Uh, I might ask you if you guess, you could guess what this is, because and you probably would, very few people would know. Close up, some people would recognize it. It's wood vetch, Vicia sylvatica. And up on the north coast, it grows in the open on those uh, sand promontories in quantity. Uh, we have it in woods down on the west coast, but that, that was something of a surprise, beautiful thing. This is the mouth of the Hallidale going out to the left, a damage over a thing called modestly Big House, uh, which is a private estate, but one can walk over there, people stay there. This is a salmon river, so fishermen stay there. And I'm going to take you in a moment over onto the hillside on the far side uh, to show you one or two things. That's a, a great place for bird watching in the season, obviously, and there were probably some things there when we went. But um, uh, one peculiar plant in, in the middle distance was masses of vipers bugloss, which is a very uncommon thing up here. Okay, here's one of the maps showing on the left, you can see uh, the actual uh, uh, estuary. The last picture was taken from there looking across. Uh, here's a day's botanizing. Uh, I forgot which order we did it in. Did we start up, up there, Gwen, and the, the over to the lock? We, I think we did. In the morning, we, we parked at a corner and walked up to a lock, which proved to be extremely dull, although there were some quite nice things on the way. And then we came back and parked in a quarry uh, uh, on a bit of old road and did the roadsides. Roadsides are very rich, um, very diverse. And then we went down into a little valley. I don't know if you can see my pointer twitching, but never mind. There's a tiny little valley. We hadn't got many plants that grow alongside burns. So we thought we'd go down and have a look in, in that valley. And that's what it looked like. This is the old road. And there was a new road behind the, oh no, that's the modern road, I think. Uh, it's full of purple moorgrass, tussocks. Uh, we picked up one or two things along the burn, and as we got into the tussock grassland, we saw a large female adder. I haven't got a picture, uh, because we then saw another large female adder and a third large female adder. It was August, it was hot, they were ready to pup, so to speak, I think, and we got Jess running loose. So she had to come on the lead very quickly and we had to come out of there very fast because although we got wellies, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been a sense of race and certainly not her. But um, we do get adders, we see them occasionally, but I don't think I've well, only once seen more than, uh, seen three or four together. But that was obviously their area for having their young. Um, around the top of the picture is the main road going off out of um, West Sutherland into Caithness. Right, we are right on the boundary. The left hand side, those um, sort of uh, triangular topped uh, deposits of glacial material on uh, old red sandstone are in West Sutherland and the right hand side is in Caithness. And the interesting thing there was uh, that that brown surface on, on the furthest hill here which Gwen went down the side and took a closer photograph. Not that close, but close enough. This was a huge puffing colony. Uh, the grass was suffering uh, and there were puffins everywhere as, as close as we could get. Uh, I, uh, and it is a famous 
puffing colony. It's a place called Geoeski or Drum Holliston. And you walk down the county boundary to get to it. And there are mostly in West Sussex, but just, just a, a curiosity that we'd gone down to see and did a little bit of recording as well. Okay, now we're going up the Halladale. The Halladale is quite agricultural, which is unusual for us because agriculture, apart from sheep and cattle, has virtually disappeared from the West Coast and a lot of the North Coast. But um, so there are, and also the Halladale Lower Dam was straightened out in the 1820s, I think, or possibly the 1840s, it doesn't matter, um, by the Duke using shovels and carts and horses. But then occasionally you get rock pinches like this and that's a, an obvious place to go for, bio, for botanical diversity. And you get things like Mountain Everlasting and such like on, on those rocks. So that was in the middle of a day which had started very well with Greater Butterfly Orchid and then the hybrid orchid between Heath Spotted and Northern Marsh on the side of a road and then we, we worked our way down to the River Halladale. This is a, on the east side on the edge of the flow country. Um, this is a thing called the Trantlebeg Burn. We had, it was a warm day. We'd uh, trudged, I think is the right word, across about two kilometres of ground, uh, um, dry heath, some of it had been burnt squidgy bits some quite good flushes and by tea time we'd come back to the burn and we're going to walk down the burn because burn sides are always good for things uh, particularly when they go through little gorges. Uh, Ro is a little figure in the far background there she'd gone off but other members of the party decided to have a rest. She won't bless me for that but uh, we'd had our tea and we did have a half an hour break there <laughs> and then got back um, through a deer fence uh, and completed the rest of the square. I'm going to finish off with a bit of the flow country which is well known. Um, it's a lot of it's now owned by RSPV and they have erected this viewing platform. In the background the two big hills called Ben Graham Beg, Little Ben Graham and Ben Graham Moor on the left. Um, ben Graham Beg, they're, they're Ben Green Beg is half in West Sutherland, half in East Sutherland. We're right on another boundary, a botanical boundary. We went there in 2017 on 21st of August by train. We, uh, we went across some ascent, uh, four of us, got a train at Laird Station in the middle of Scotland uh, and then went up the coast past Helmsdale. Beautiful run and got off at Forsinard Station in the middle of the flow country. I'll return to the station in a moment to finish off with. But uh, we, we, had, uh, we, we had told RSPB um, we were coming and they kindly provided us with a, uh, a chap, a uh, young uh, was our guide and he took us out to the viewing platform and there's me, David Haynes, who runs our website, Gwen, Avril Haynes, and our guide. Uh, um, interestingly, this has got steps going up to the upper part of the viewing platform, which uh, swallows had already colonised and were nesting. And from the top, you get a picture of uh, a, a fairly typical bit of flows with what are known as dulocans, black black lockens, um, not botanically rich, good for sphagna, 15 species of sphagna at least in that sort of area, nesting dunlin, um, common scota, green shank, that sort of thing, not just there because that's near, very near to the, the platform, the viewing platform, but it, it's flat ground on very deep peat and in the top right you can see one of the scourges of the area which is plantation forestry, which is now being removed. But this area had not been planted and is a very good place. You, you get the train to Force and Art Station, get off, and then wait some hours for the train to come back from Thurzo and Wick. And that's what we did. We had about four hours. At this point, David and Avril went off to see the RSPB field station, which is very well equipped. Gwen and I went off to botanize round the railway line and the station. 
because it hadn't been done on that sort of messy ground does give you quite a good species list and you do get some unexpected species one of which appears in the next picture Gwen noticed this we were actually the other side of the railway line uh, on a platform it was about an hour before the train was due and it was you wasn't it it was Gwen uh, who's sitting to my left uh, and she noticed this yellow flower uh, it's obvious enough to you, you'll know yellow toe flax is extremely rare in the north of Scotland. We've never found it over in the west. I've seen it once in, in the northeast. Uh, no, twice. Um, only once in west Scotland. But there, uh, this was a picture that was taken later. I had to see this but with my own eyes. I mean, I, I could make a very good guess of what it was. In fact, we may have identified it across the railway line. So. I skipped across the line, uh, <clears throat> ignoring notices which I hadn't no had noticed, which said thousand pound fine for, fine for trespass on the railway line. So it was a totally irresponsible act. What I didn't know is that friend David had taken a confounded picture of me actually breaking the law, as you can see. So there's me crossing the line, knowing it was quite safe. And there's Gwen. <laughs> Okay, that's a very quick look along, a well, hop along the north coast and back up Strathalladale. I'm going to finish with one more image because um, it's a nice picture. Uh, we, we, we do take our botany fairly seriously. Uh, we have over the last five, in the five years, accumulated from that area 24,000 records from 175 sites. Um, given these are all done in two or three weeks in the summer, we haven't done badly, um, but there's a huge amount of the area which has uh, still never been botanised. I'm the only BSBI member in West Sutherland. There are no other, well, I mean, there are resident botanists like Gwen and others, but nobody else is a member of the BSBI. This, on our way back from these trips right over to the east, which may be an hour and a half drive, we, we tried to get back to Betty Hill before five o'clock when the shop closes in order to pick up ice creams and come and sit down here uh, uh, above Betty Hill, looking out across the Neva at uh, the beginning of Torresdale Sands. And in the mid background is one of the islands, Aylan Lee, which we now visited twice. Um, so I think, you know, uh, the, the point I want to finish with, we, we, I said we take our botany seriously, but we, uh, we do like to have some fun along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Uh, can we ask a few questions? Yes, fine. I, I, I was very pleased to see Tony Fletcher, uh, who is a, a lichenologist, ex-colleague and great friend, uh, from who lives at Littlethorpe near um, Narborough. Uh, he has spent quite a lot of time uh, in this part of uh, uh, um, West Sutherland, been up on a, a, a great number of visits and uh, contributed greatly to our knowledge of the lichens of this area. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Ian, um, you mentioned um, towards the end uh, collecting records um, in two or three weeks of your short summer. What, yes. what, sort of time, what sort of time of the year would uh, be nice to visit? I mean, I'm, people say that May is one of the best weather times in parts of Scotland. Is that true or not? That's a bit early. Uh, you, uh, June and July, not, and May can be very nice, but it's a bit early for a lot of the flowers, if you're interested in the flowers, it, it may be better for birds. Um, but yes, it would be better for things like seabirds on Hander Island and things like that. But uh, uh, if, if you're interested in the flowers and the sort of general landscape, then June or early, the first half of July, we botanize from the beginning of June normally. In fact, we were botanizing <laughs> through to just before Christmas this year. <laughs> because it's been a, um, an odd year, but um, <laughs> if you're visiting, uh, unfortunately, 
but June or July, I would yeah. say. May is a bit yeah. early. And yeah. also, yeah. it's better for midges, though. Uh, midges are not a problem if there's some wind. Uh, they can be a problem if there isn't. Uh, we get midged once or twice. <coughs> Pardon me. If somebody would like to ask a question, perhaps they could um, wave with their hand and then unmute themselves. If, we, if we've got several people, we'll name someone. Would anybody like to follow up with another question? Uh, Ray, can you unmute yourself, please? Thanks, Nick. Uh, Ian, it's nice to see you after so many years. And you, Ray. Yeah, and you are the curse of my life because in 1980, the early 1980s, you persuaded me to follow insects, <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. Um, you <coughs> insects a couple of times. <coughs> what is the insect life like up there, apart from the midges, of course? Well, Gwen, who's sitting to my left, is more of an authority. The the but um, well, to give you an example, we only have about ten species of dragonflies, Odonata. <laughs> although they include the uh, azure hawker, uh, uh, but we're a bit far north for them. We have two species of orthoptera, no, three species of orthoptera only. Um, uh, moths, quite a good variety. Gwen moth traps and, uh, I mean, I moth trapped for 10 years and got about 250 species, 200 macros, 50 miles. Um, beetles don't know, uh, are underworked. It, um, it's good in, in, in the summer, but tails off, I suppose. But what else? What no, they're not. Butterflies are, I mean, we're good for small pole border fritillary, dark green fritillary, grayling, uh, large heath, scutch argus. Uh, we do a butterfly count regularly and but not a huge variety. We, we, if you go on the Field Club website, um, we've just put up a Butterflies of Ascent. That's ascentwildlife.org.uk. Have a look at that anyway. So um, not a huge amount is known. Uh, when Stephen comes up to the North Coast, which he does regularly, he will quite often pick up stuff uh, that nobody's had from the north of Scotland. It's not difficult. It's very, very underworked. If there are a few botanists, there are very, very few entomologists, some round in Maness. Does that answer your question? It, we're, we're short on, on species that like sunshine, uh, and we don't know about some of the other groups. Yeah. Um, well, no, my, my main interest these days is caddisflies, and with your water there, and you've got some highland species as well. Yes, uh, we have. I, I just wondered... Uh, uh, we've variety. got quite a good caddis list, and I think, again, if you go on our field club website, there is a caddis list, or there will be, because we have, we've had some of the tiny caddis. Just trying to think of the name now, it begins with T, but, uh, and I can't remember the name, but we do have some of the very... Terraclia, probably. What? Terraclia. Um, no, I can't remember. Anyway. But we, yeah, we have had... We've had a, a malaise trap running on one of the local locks a few years ago. I haven't quite finished the report yet, but the stuff, uh, I collected the stuff and it was sent away. Uh, caddis are good. Um, stoneflies are good. Mayflies are good. Uh, so and mosquitoes. Um, they're not a problem. Uh, we do get culicoides impunctatus, the highland midge, yeah. uh, and that can be a pest uh, on very still days. Yeah. But it, it's still pretty underworked, this area. Yeah. I mean, you're doing great stuff in Leicestershire. I enjoy the LES um, presentations immensely, and so does Gwen. And they, I, I share them around the Highlands. Well, thanks, Steve Woodward, for producing it. Yes, lovely, lovely pics. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. And anyone else? Can... I'm just trying to see if anybody's waving at us. I don't think so. <laughs> so um, Ian, um, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, it's very impressive the um, recording techniques you showed us at the beginning, how carefully and thoroughly the research is undertaken. Um, 
obviously we've seen many wonderful photos, um, uh, particularly struck by ones like the meadow with uh, Ben Lowen in the background and um, the wonderful um, species uh, photographs that probably Gwen's taken, the fungi, plants like um, the greater knapweed and the purple um, oxyperis. Um, re really wonderful. Um, I really commend you on your fluent delivery of the excellent talk. It's um, lovely that you put it in the context of um, the grazing pressure and the land use in the area. Highly informative and most enjoyable. And uh, you played a big part in helping us continue our Natural History Society talks at a difficult time. So on behalf of the Society, I'd like to thank you very much for contributing so fully. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.